Hey folks, Fishbat here. I recently picked up Hellfire and Stone. This was a campaign book released for the first edition of Kings of War in March 2014, and I've had a read through it and I thought I'd make a review. So Hellfire and Stone is no longer in print, it's only released as a digital download, as a PDF, ebook or Kindle, and it seems to be on a permanent 50% discount, which makes it £4, 7 US dollars, or 5 euros. The PDF contains 50 colour pages, including 6 scenarios, plus a 7th for Dwarf King's Hold, a painting and terrain guide, and some unique campaign rules and characters. I'll go over the different parts of the book to review the lore, the scenarios, the extras, and then give my final thoughts. So, part 1, the lore. The campaign takes place in the northeast of Mantica, in a region called the Halpy Mountains. The two sides taking part in the conflict are the Abyssal Dwarfs and the regular Dwarfs. Leading the Abyssal Dwarfs is Arak Solbinder, the supreme ironcaster of the Zarak clan. Arak himself had once been a regular Dwarf, but in a spectacular show of backstabbery, uh, left his hold in awful fashion and made off to the north to Tralgar where he became an Abyssal Dwarf. That was a thousand years ago and ever since then he has been uh, backstabbing and using sorcery and working his way up through the ranks of Abyssal Dwarf society until he is now the supreme iron caster of the most powerful clan. He is second only to Lord Xerxes who is the self-proclaimed overking of the Abyssal Dwarfs being the most powerful king of the most powerful clan. Arak is very, very ambitious and seeks to move himself even higher in the world and to extend his dominion and power. After spending a very long time in the libraries, he has discovered references to what is called the Quartz Scepter, an artifact of great power wielded by ancient dwarven king. And this ancient dwarven king used the scepter to emphasize, would you say? No, to, to empower, yes, to empower his command and his leadership so that those nearby obeyed him with great vigor. And with this, he's made a very, very successful dwarven hold. However, this came at a cost. The court scepter ate away at the ancient dwarven king's very soul. And Dwarves are very resistant to such powers, but even this great king eventually uh, would crumble before its power as well, and did go mad, and the court scepter had to be thrown away in the deepest, darkest vault of this fortress, which very shortly after, without having a good king in charge, fell to marauding all courts. And now, Arak Solbinder, millennia later, thinks that he has discovered the whereabouts of this old dwarven hold and therefore the whereabouts of the Quartz Scepter. So, Arak goes to King Xerxes and says to him that he has this plan to get back the Quartz Scepter and give it to King Xerxes, so that King Xerxes can be the most powerful fellow in all of Mantica and then can extend his rule from ocean to ocean. And King Xerxes rather likes this idea and says, Radio, let's do it, let's go full forwards. And King Xerxes gathers up the biggest army which he can manage. He gets a phenomenally huge army. Hundreds of thousands. Including the slaves, millions even. And Arak is very impressed by how much Xerxes has dedicated towards this effort. Given that Arak is planning to backstab him eventually if he should ever get the scepter. Now, the Halpy Mountains are not vacant. They are inhabited by dwarfs to this very day. In the midst of the Halpy Mountains is the hold of what I can only pronounce as Cool Gem, led by the Berserker Lord Sveri Egalax. Sveri Egalax has uh, succumbed to what is called the Red Curse, which has afflicted his bloodline for a thousand years. The kings of Cool Gem have, in all of that time, had a very, very thin amount of patience. 
and will burst into madness at the least frustration. He is a very, very impulsive, almost maddened king if something ticks him off, and things almost certainly will. This red curse on his bloodline, it's been there for a thousand years, began when his ancestor, the first king of Kulgen, was betrayed by his chief advisor and war master, who later became known as Arak Soulbinder. Who would have guessed it? And when Arak left, he not only cursed Ziri Eglaka's ancestor, but returned with a big Abyssal Dwarf army and stomped him in as well. So Severi Eglax has a score to settle with Arax Soulbinder, and whilst in the Helping Mountains, his scouts hear messages of Orc tribes fleeing from a massive army. And throughout the course of the campaign, the dwarfs of Kulgen learn not only of the oncoming Abyssal Dwarf army, but that it is led by Arax Soulbinder. And so Severi Eglax sets out very very eager for revenge, and eager as well to lift this curse which has been on his family for a thousand years. Eventually, the dwarfs of Kulgen learn of the objectives of the Abyssal Dwarf army in trying to get the court scepter, and they begin racing and fighting in order to try to uh, stop the Abyssal Dwarfs from ever getting near that scepter. So that's the, the general gist of the, the fluff leading up to the campaign, and there are little snippets here and there throughout it which give a nice little bit of amusement to what's going on in the world and some of the minor characters in the story. There's not a lot there, but it, it's enough that it's just a bit interesting, just a little bit juicy. So, part two, scenarios. In the campaign book there are six missions. Um, and there's a good little variety there. The, the first one is a skirmish over a gold mine. Um, there's also a dwarven messenger which is trying to run off and alert the others. Uh, that the abyssal dwarfs are of course trying to catch and kill. The second mission is an ambush on a marching column. The third mission is trying to capture a piece of territory. There is a cave that the abyssal dwarfs are trying to go into to speak to a mystic. Um, the, f the fourth mission is a last stand slash delaying action where a group of heroic dwarfs are trying to hold off the abyssal dwarfs long enough for the dwarfs of Kulgen to reach the hold before the abyssal dwarfs do. And it's it's actually kind of funny because they um it's it's full of references to the Mopoli. For example, it's not called the Hot Gates, it's the the Flaming Gates. And the leader of the regiment of Bullwalkers holding off the Abyssal Dwarfs is named Leon after Leonidas. And of course, the leader of the Abyssal Dwarfs is named Xerxes, so, you know, it all, all fits together. Um, the fifth mission is a big showdown, just a, a, a big classic battle, um, with all the named characters included. And the, the sixth mission, then, is the reaction to the final battle. Whoever lost it now, uh, they have the reinforcements on the way, and they've got to try and fend off a bigger force until the reinforcements can come to help them, and then it's a, a wrestle over control of the scepter. So uh, I feel like it's a good little variety of missions there, and the way the missions are connected is quite good. In a lot of campaigns you can have a sort of snowballing effect. Uh, in a campaign of course you want an incentive to complete the early missions well, not to complete, but to win the early missions for rewards later, but the rewards can't be too strong or else you'll snowball and win the campaign in a crushing victory, it won't be interesting. But the rewards seem to be just right. For example, the first mission you are trying to control a gold mine. Uh, if you control a gold mine, this represents some extra wealth you're going to get to pay for more troops, and in each sub uh, subsequent game, you can upgrade a troop one level for free. For example, a troop to a regiment, or a regiment to horde without paying the points cost. Pretty reasonable. In the third mission, if the Abyssal Dwarfs capture the cave, uh, the obsidian golems in the army are no longer shambling because Arak Soulbinder has learned greater spellcasting abilities. Things like this. Things that are which are nice little uh, extras and bonuses and good for the narrative, but that don't break the game by adding too much. 
there are also little extra features in the campaign which make it just a little bit nice. For example, in the final mission there is a camp, uh, a camp, there is a volcano which is erupting. And the longer the battle drags on, the more the volcano is going to spew lava and ash and all sorts of horrible things and start hurting soldiers on the field. So you not only get interesting scenarios, but you get interesting things happening as well, environmental things. In the, the Last Stand mission, there's also Driving Rain, which limits the effects of range attacks. War machines can't fire because they can't get sight, and even handheld ranged weapons can only fire a very short distance. So let's go into part three, extras. The Hellfire and Stone book has not just some missions, but it's got a, a few pages on how to paint some of the units involved. For example, they show how to paint the shields for the Kulgen Hold, tips on painting Dwarven flesh, and they tell you how to make some of the terrain used for the campaign as well. From looking over the painting guides, they appear to be more for the beginner painter. I think accomplished painters and seasoned hobbyists probably won't find too much of interest here. They'll already know all this stuff. But for newer painters, yeah, I can see how it would definitely be useful. Um, the terrain guides, yeah, they're, they're pretty nice. You don't really need to make terrain for this campaign, but it would be fitting if you did. And as uh, you can see in this picture here, I've already started to build a mine because I anticipate actually playing out these games and hopefully I'll make some battle reports which I'll put up on the channel. Because I thought a few narrative games would make a nice change of pace. Uh, the other extras are some extra rules you have for different units. At the time they came out they were new, and these include things like uh, slave orcs and... Uh, had slave orcs always been in there? Let's have a look. Anyway, slave orc gore riders are new in this book, and... These already have rules that have been superseded by Kings of War 2nd Edition, so we can ignore most of them. But it ha does have the special rules for Zveri Egalax and Arak Soulbinder, which are pretty good for the narrative missions. So, part 4, production values. Something I was quite disappointed in in this book was that there was some um, layout problems. I opened the PDFs in a few different readers and the problems persisted, but as you can see in this picture, there are some pretty bad formatting errors. You've got bits of text in the wrong place, you've got uh, pictures that are overlapping things, just not good, makes it very hard to read. Fortunately this is only restricted to about four pages, and these are the pages which are full of the special rules for new units which we can mostly ignore anyway, apart from for the special characters involved. But it, it is still a bit sloppy. However, as this picture will show you, uh, apart from these four pages, by and large the book is very well laid out, it's easy to follow, um, you get colourful pictures and sketches here and there, and it's certainly not the flashiest book I've ever seen, but it's, it's certainly very presentable. So, final thoughts. Um, Hellfire and Stone has varied and interesting scenarios. Uh, the lore, it is not incredibly fleshed out. I was hoping to get a really detailed look at the different kinds of societies that Dwarves and Abyssal Dwarves have, but we, we really don't learn anything about their societies. Um, but we, we do um, get a good bit of lore about this campaign and some of the characters involved, and yeah, it was interesting and charming. The painting and terrain guides are nice. Uh, good for beginners, perhaps not so much for accomplished hobbyists. Uh, and with the exception of those few pages, the book is neatly laid out uh, and given a few good decorations. So my final verdict. Hellfire and Stone is a solid little campaign book with enough content to satisfy, and given it's really, really low price, I think it's is pretty good value. Um, the change in edition really hasn't diminished the value of this book at all, and if you are interested in... Dwarfs, Abyssal Dwarfs, or narrative games, then I could recommend it. Although this campaign does focus on Abyssal Dwarfs and Dwarfs, uh, there's no reason why you can't substitute any armies you'd like in this, if you can make your own narrative, you can just use these scenarios. So I think that, yeah, that's pretty much summarises most of my thoughts on Hellfire and Stone. 
The other things I wanted to mention are that in this video you've probably seen the models that were there for Arax Holbinder and Severi Eglax. I don't think they are available from Mantic Store anymore, so you'll have to produce your own models if you wanted to use them as your own characters. But that shouldn't be too big of a deal for anyone to use whatever they have in their collection. But thanks for listening, hope you enjoyed this review, and let me know your thoughts below. Bye.